and speak out of his back and just advance there. All right. Well, I'm here to talk about the Bonanza Creek LTER and the interior boreal forests of Alaska. And um, little bits of news. We had a very successful um, exhibit of our arts, humanities, and science collaborative process in a time of change. And I, um, oh, it's not showing up, but I would um, encourage you to go look at our website where there's just fantastic art. So if you're interested in botanical art or sense of place or different sorts of depictions of science in the boreal forest, um, looking at this exhibit is quite fantastic, even online. Um, we were renewed in the last cycle, and we now have polar programs, Arctic research operations, polar field support, which means we're going to get off the road system like all of the other high latitude LTERs. Um, two new projects to mention, and if these sound interesting, I can tell you more about them. One is a, a circumboreal Arctic carbon warning network, AWARE, and the second is sustainable ecological engineering and design, SEEDS, for wildfire risk reduction. All right, so I want to start here first just thinking about Bonanza Creek Experimental Forest on the Tanana River. This is the ancestral lands of the Dina people of the lower Tanana River. And it is with them that we seek reconciliation, particularly in the new iteration of our LTER renewal, where we're working towards increased collaboration to provide information and capacity building for Alaska Natives in the interior forests. Okay, so fast forward a little in time and we'll think of the very first Bonanza Creek LTER where my progenitors Keith Van Cleve and Les Virick use distance from this river as a way of isolating the state factor of time in ecosystem development. So space for time to infer ecosystem development after disturbance. And although they didn't depict it, in this early figure, this also provides mechanistic understanding of the factors that drive spatial heterogeneity as you move away from this large boreal river. All right, so fast forward even more in time to the last decade of the Bonanza Creek LTER, where we've had a lot of focus on longitudinal scaling to understand the role of the boreal and the Arctic biome in the Earth system, particularly by understanding carbon cycling feedbacks to climate. Um, we've used a range of techniques, all the way from process-based studies that inform many different types of scaling, even expert elicitation to understand, well, from the bottom, permafrost carbon density and carbon emissions, changes in plant productivity, and then in fire activity and disturbance activity, all associated with climate warming. All right, so I'm going to focus in on fire here. Um, and you guys all know that wildfires are moving elements from the ecosystem into the atmosphere. Or they're redepositing them on the surface of the ecosystem. And simultaneously, they're opening up space for recruitment of new individuals, new genotypes, new species. So what we're primarily interested in is understanding both contributions of boreal carbon to the atmosphere via disturbance, but also how those changes in ecosystem structure affect the resilience of net ecosystem carbon balance to climate warming and wildfire. Okay, so that's sort of the, the framing question. And so when we start looking at things like ecosystem carbon loss during wildfire, well, we start at almost a point scale going down into the soil. And so we're reconstructing carbon that was there and we're estimating carbon emissions and we're measuring the residual carbon. And some researchers have been known to take carbon loss from that very point basis and to extrapolate it by the area burned. So that's probably my specialty a mean extrapolated by a very large area. But we know that all of these things vary and they vary at different spatial scales. And they likely have an important influence 
on burning and carbon emissions. So think about the spatial scale of understory vegetation, or maybe the spatial scale of stand structure. Or finally, when we get into the patchy distribution of lakes or the dendritic distribution of watersheds on the landscape, we have to start thinking about scaling, right? And so one of the scaling rules that we've been focusing on is the idea that as you increase the sample area, we should expect that carbon emissions decline. So if you're someone like me that uses a little ruler and a soil knife to estimate emissions, probably overestimating emissions. Okay, and so this is where some work by Xanthi Walker that's here comes in, and I just wanna give you an example. So starting out, even estimating burned area is not trivial. And so this shows you um, four different types of products. Some are modus-based, and then here we have Landsat-based. And, and there's sort of an interaction in some of the ways that these burned area data products have been produced. But in the last decade, we've moved to this Landsat-based depiction of burned area on the landscape because it's the only way that we've been able to incorporate that patchy distribution of hydrological features. All right, so thinking about scaling wildfire carbon emissions, you know, it goes beyond just that ruler in the soil. It goes to understanding landscape scale variation in carbon pools. So for instance, in this context, the differences in drainage from really dry to really wet, and then understanding how other landscape factors like the proportion of the key species black spruce affects combustion. So hypothesis testing via statistical modeling based on field data that's much more comprehensive than, well, how I started out. Um, but then we can scale that using our MODIS product with machine learning and some other types of landscape scale information to get then a estimate of carbon emissions throughout the whole fire perimeter. So process-based understanding and then spatial scaling. Um, and so one of the things from this study we found out that there is our estimates of emissions relative to modus based estimates of emissions were almost 43% less. Okay, so a substantial reduction in the estimate of emissions partially due to better fitting landscape dynamics or landscape patterns to estimates of emission, but also due to an improvement in the remote sensing of burned area. And so we can take these kind of data and it contributes back to thinking about feedbacks to the atmosphere. So almost half less, that's important for understanding the role of the boreal forest and fire in the global carbon budget, but also we can understand the future of these ecosystems and how long-term net ecosystem carbon balance may be impacted by increasing wildfire activity. Thank you.